This is Simone. And this is Katinka. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. We are talking to Maura Barreto today, the Director within the Transformational Program Management at KPMG. Maura has been in and around project, program, and portfolio management for 18 years, currently working as a Director at KPMG within the Transformational Program Management practice. Before joining, she was GM business transformation, head of IT PMO, and various leadership roles in planning and governance, where she initiated the development of the PM methodology and governance framework for IT projects. Prior to the corporate career, she was a professional ballerina of the Royal Academy of London certified and ballet teacher. Welcome, Maura. Thank you so much for your time today. We usually start with an introduction, so please go ahead and tell us about yourself and your tech journey. Thank you, Simani, um, and thank you so much for having me here. So yeah, I've been on, in the world of major transformation and program management for nearly 20 years now, and uh, started my career in Brazil. So I'm Brazilian, was born in Brazil, and um, just always had the desire to go overseas and have some variety and have different experiences and um, pretty much left my job there um, with the United Nations where I was setting up um, PMOs for uh, big programs and decided to start new and have a new beginning here. So in the last 17, 18 years that I've been here, I've had the opportunity to work across a number of sectors But most recently, I'm focused on financial services. And as you mentioned, I'm directing the transformation program management practice in KPMG, mostly working with uh, banks, insurers, and in the wealth management space too. So what I do and I'm good at, I help organizations to transform. So in short, moving from where they are now to where they want to get to. And I feel that it's part of my role. And I think that's how I define who I am is I am part of... uh, a, a bigger team, a bigger environment where I, I do believe that alone we don't achieve anything. So I work with a group of people and a group of different skill sets, different uh, domain areas, people from different sectors and different perspectives to co- that come together to bring solutions for clients, whether they are trying to transform, to set up a new product range, whether they are trying to resolve an issue we're fixing, let's say for a bank, a remediation type of issue, whether they are looking at, I don't know, an issue in the, uh, in the deal space and M&A, mergers, mergers and acquisition. So whatever that type of problem is, they're changing the organization structure, they're ch- changing their target of bread and water. To me, it's about how we bring the best of the, that skill set and the people and we have a plan in place to to achieve that change and and that transformation successfully. So that's pretty much what I do. As for who I am in my personal life, uh, as Simone said, I used to be a professional ballerina. This was my first career. And I think from that, I got a lot of the persistence, the discipline, really uh, striving for perfection and, and to be better. And I think it helps a lot uh, for the work that I do today. I'm also a mum of a 16-year-old boy, um, Nicholas, and and I'm also a wife to, to Alex. So yeah, I've got a family. Uh, there's all this other side of me, which is about travel too. I love I love experiencing new things. I love being in different places, meeting different people. To me, this is what gives me excitement and energy so yeah i'm a passionate traveler and also uh, a key player in the world of transformation wow that's nothing that is simple is it (laughs) (laughs) no it's the world of complexity (laughs) but part of what i do is to make things simple yeah so i guess when clients come to us it's they are in a, generally in a world of pain or they have a certain problem that they need us to support them. And part of my job is to really look at what are those steps that need to be taken to, to make it simple and digestible and, and achievable and successful. So what is the difference between transformation and innovation? And when do you apply one versus the other? I think the biggest difference between transformation and innovation is that I think 
innovation can be a sprint, while transformation is always a marathon. You don't transform overnight. You don't change where uh, and to what we want to become as an organization overnight. You need to have that resilience and you need to have all the components in place and knowing that it's, it's a change in the culture, it's a change in the way that you're going to be doing things, it's a changing mindset, it's, a, it's, it's something that it, you're going to be there for the long haul in terms of achieving what you need to achieve. Well, to me, innovation can be more of a sprint. You could be achieving those things potentially without the, those components of, of transformation. But I think one probably comes at the back of the other one too, to, to be innovative and, and have that culture of innovation and being sustainable. You may be needing those transformation components. Yeah, that's and a that's, really good comparison, yeah. It can be sharp and the other one is always more long-term. Yeah, I think so. And maybe innovation is more event-driven. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, while transformation is not necessarily, right? Or maybe, I don't know, depending on the size of the company or the age of the company, they might be more used to transform rather than to innovate. Or some of them say, oh, for innovating, I'll have to kind of drop everything off and start anew. Is that true? Yeah, not necessarily, hey, because innovation can be the things that you do a little bit different every day and you build that into the way that you do things in the culture and you become more innovative and you have a culture and a team that is more innovative. Yeah, it can be a bit bit by bit, I think. They come hand in hand because in many transformations, you need to have that aspect of innovation too, right? Uh, that aspect of thinking different about a problem that you have not thought of thinking through a different lens to, to what you're used to but in order to actually achieve that you you need to to transform and, and it is a long term and a longer journey it's as if potentially innovation is the enabler i guess for for transformation it's embedded in every step of the way yeah that's a good question and everyone will have a different perspective on that right it depends on where you come from more from the world of innovation versus the world of transformation yeah, exactly to me is if you think about numbers um 70 of transformation files it's a huge number if you think about it it's <laughs> that means that only 30 percent succeed so what is it that needs to be done to increase the number of transformations that do succeed and to me it's it's probably attributed to three things and very simple things actually but it's just it's easy to be said and hard to be done the first one is it's around a, a, a the plan everyone talks about oh we need we need to have a plan we need to know where we're going but but do you have that plan documented and understood does everyone that's involved understand that do they know what what are really the big decisions that you're going to need to make about that plan and, and when and how is it going to get you from where you are now to where you need to be? So that broader integrated plan, because there's so many aspects, right? If you are in any transformation project, you may be dealing with, I don't know, a new piece of technology. And there's the people aspects too. You cannot roll out a technology until you actually bring the people on board because you're not going to be successful with that. And then there's the data aspect, which is a, another complexity that's added there. And a lot of time people underestimate how complex that is. And there's so many aspects of um, how you, you plan for it and ensure that there is that integration. So to me, that planning, it's, it should not be underestimated. It, you should understand as to why you were doing that and what uh, that purpose needs to come into that plan. And also, what are the risks associated with that? I mean, have you built enough contingency in that plan to make sure that it accounts for all the things that could potentially go wrong? Uh, because you do lose credibility when you have a plan that it's not achievable and then you have to replan, you have to start all over again. And I've been on projects that you have to, most of what, of what we did, well, uh, in terms of having to support um, that transformation was to, to go through replan because uh, it was not set as an achievable plan initially. The second thing is around governance and how do you define who needs to make what decisions and when 
and how are you going to engage the broader organization because you are just one part for that particular transformation you may be just dealing with one particular area of the organization but that will have an impact on many other areas and therefore how are you engaging with the broader organization and within that particular transformation program and who are the th those people that need to make the decisions um, around that and, and this is highly important because you need to identify up front who they are and and why why are they in that position right there needs to be a rationale they need to have significant buying to that so what's in it for them why is it so important to them why does it matter so best transformation programs we've been part of uh, were a result of the leadership for that program at an executive level to have been assigned to the right person so a lot of the time it is not it may be a technology program but it, the cio is not the executive sponsor it's a business related transformation at the end of the day so we need to to understand um, who are the most impacted executive and the most interested and the most has the most skin in the game to make sure that it is successful the third one is around capability and capacity a lot of the time how many times have we seen major projects in which they have assigned people that were available people that have just simply become available because they were retrenched from another area, they have, they have gone through a redundancy process or they have simply, or they are interested in the project, but they may not have the, the right capability to be able to support that project. So to me, it is um, a capability and a capacity issue at the same time. It is ensuring that you've got the right capability and that capability is available. How many times do we have issues with people trying to do their BAU roles combined with their project or transformation roles? You can't. There is, there's always, when there are competing priorities, generally you're gonna have to focus on keeping the lights on and keep the business running. So it does not, it, it doesn't help a transformation program when you actually have uh, people sharing um, those roles. A lot of the time, well, yeah, depending on, on how much of the capacity or input may be required, but if it's someone that's required day-to-day -to, -day to be developing outputs for the project, it is uh, unlikely that they're going to succeed if they are in a shared role. So to me, having the right um, capacity um, and capability it, it is absolutely key to success and to the point that I raised earlier is really the understanding of it is a marathon transformation is not a sprint you're there for the long and and for the whole journey and you need to ensure that everyone involved from the people developing and working with each of the work streams of that project being yeah technology data or people or whatever it may be through the the senior stakeholders, as well as all the impacted parties, the people that will be impacted by that change. Either a call center that will have, I don't know, will be exposed to a new system or whatever that may be that you are transforming or implement, that everyone sort of understands that, yeah, you, you need to plan things and you need to manage that program as if it's a marathon because people will get tired. So how many times do you see people having change fatigue for a program going on for so long? And if, if you have that mindset of, yeah, it's a marathon and therefore uh, we need to consider that in the way that we resource, in the way that we understand business impacts and in the way that we manage those business impacts, that will also support you being successful. I guess just to summarize, yeah, to me that it comes down, success in transformations to me, to me comes down to, to those four aspects, realistic plan that's shared and socialized and owned by everyone, governance in place that everyone understands what decisions and when they need to make and that those decisions are made by the right stakeholder groups, the right skill set um, and the right capability and capacity there to support the program. And then finally, understanding and have a mindset that a transformation is a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Well, the number that you said at the beginning, so out of 10, 
transformation projects, only a three are successful. So that's definitely a huge failure number. And based on what you said, they, it totally makes sense because, you know, they go in the golden triangle, people, process, and technology. They have to, they must have a synergy, not just among those three things, but among everybody that is in the project, definitely. That's, uh, yeah, I'm not surprised why that uh, number of failures is big because to coordinate and make the synergy, be, you know, amongst all those things to happen is not an easy task. Absolutely. And I think this is the, the, the hardest task, isn't it? It's, everyone thinks that it is about the technology or the technical aspects of a program those will get sorted out. It's, it's generally about how you go about bringing people together and bringing people on the journey. And um, yeah, I, I used to work for um, a, a fantastic leader, which was actually uh, the CIO at Medibank at the time that I was there. And he used to say, this was when I was still uh, in the technology era. And they used to say, he used to say, technology is about people. And it really is. It's all about people. Uh, at the end of the day, and again, transformation is about people. So everything is about people. And it is the most complex part of everything that we have to do. And it becomes complex because we often just don't spend as much time or as much effort or put as much focus as we should. Yeah, so I'm also curious why uh, you think transformation is necessary so, for example, is um, transformation something that organizations have to do continuously or is it triggered by something? So is there a certain time in an organization's life that when something happens and then they realize they have to transform? So what are the signs? How do we know it's time to transform an organization? I think with transformation and the need for it, well, I think it has two types, right? One is the reactive type as to when you, you are already going through a situation where you find yourself with no other choice but to transform. And when you think about just the example we just had with COVID-19, right? Who would have thought that we would have, in a matter of days, people not having um, access to their offices anymore? And then you needed to make sure that your technology and infrastructure was in place to make sure that everyone had access to the systems that they need to continue to perform the work that they needed to perform. And then what was the next um, challenge about that is what will the world look like after COVID? And we've seen trends already that most people do not see themselves and organizations and employees do not see themselves going back to office full time. So it's probably going to be a three two two split between being in the office versus being at work. So what does that mean? What does that mean for real estate? What does that mean for, you know, in the way that you're going to be um, interacting with people going forward? And we've been going through that for eight, nine months now. We've learned a lot. We have adjusted. But now as the post-COVID time, uh, organizations have been and, and are continually thinking about what's next so i guess this is one example of just reacting to what has happened nobody was predicting that we would have a pandemic but the other side is also uh being proactive and really understanding where you are heading and what are the the next trends and what do you expect in terms of how your services and products and especially with in the digital world, for instance, how that's going to change. Because we've got more time. It's, it's more of a proactive response to those things rather than a reactive response. So it is, one, I think it's much more linked to, to strategy, where you're heading, the global trends. Um, and the other one is way more linked to, to survival <laughs> around what do I do now to pretty much keep the business running and, and not have an impact as a result of a, a situation and in that case, a pandemic that you're in? So it can be event triggered, but you have to look out for the trends and stay aware basically of what's happening around you to stay re relevant. Maura, you mentioned, of course, in terms of the reaction or uh, being reactive and not proactive uh, regarding COVID, etc. But when we talk about you know, transformation-based projects, 
specifically with COVID, is there anything else that uh, you'd have to add in terms of, you know, thinking about the rise of a digital online products or anything else that you came across the last eight, nine months that uh, you'd see that's completely different uh, that you have seen before and you haven't mentioned yet? No, if I were just to bring it to my very personal experience, because I love how um, even when we think of trains and you think where, of where the world is, sometimes we don't often think about our little uh, own world, right? Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about the other day was the, the number of shops that have now closed, right? And it's pretty sad, especially for the small businesses. But some of the big retailers, they have also closed. And when I walked past uh, here in my neighborhood, one example, for instance, is Lorna Jane. And um, I, I love active wear. And who doesn't love active wear these days, right? We all are wearing leggings at home as, <laughs> as we've been working from home. But I found that my own experience has been, I'm now an online shopper. And before, I would have hated shopping online. I would love, I was always going to a retail shop having to touch it, to try on and to experience that before buying. Nowadays, because of COVID, I ended up going shopping online for so many things that I'm more than comfortable, comfortable now to actually make all my purchases online, including active wear. So, and I ended up finding other brands and other retailers that had a better digital experience online experiences than others that I was that I used to be or like that particular brand which meant that I'm more than comfortable now to not to continue doing online shopping it does count a lot the time that I spend and, and the experience that I have online so and, and and has changed my behavior towards shopping so if you think about <laughs> I'm just one person, but it, is, it comes down to my personal experience and how many people have gone through the same. And organizations really need to think about, yeah, how that has changed. And of course they are. But my point is just think about what COVID has changed or what changes has COVID made in your personal life. Because in the grand scheme of things, this is sort of the change that you also would expect uh, to see in the in a big scheme of things we always think about or try and and think about things in the sense of oh, what are the biggest trends and th and just think about how did the nine months change me and my habits and uh, as a consumer for instance and therefore how how could it be changed um going forward right yeah in the end it all comes down to individuals and what we do on an individual level yeah absolutely we hope you enjoyed this chat with Mara as much as we did and also learned many, many things. Look out for the part two of our conversation with her. See you next time.